good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, I'm come after coffee. Hopefully, I can keep up with you because probably you have more energy than I do. Uh, big thanks to Red Hat for uh, having me over for the talk. And uh, today, what I will be talking about is completely different than everyone else. Everyone has one slide around adoption. I have a full deck around uh, adoption. So I'm Jamin Mina from uh, BMO Financial Group, and uh, I'm the catalyst behind uh, container adoptions uh, at BMO Financial Group. We're a 200-year-old company. We're young compared to Barclay. Uh, we have 12 million customers, 46,000 employees, and a lot and a lot of technical debt at BMO. Uh, we're geographically located across the world. Uh, mostly our head, uh, uh, head office is in Toronto. We have offices in uh, Asia, in Europe, and we have a large bank that we own uh, in Chicagoland, uh, Harris Bank. So this presentation is about container adoption and about the, uh, the, the ingredients that go in into container adoptions. And I'm going to list the ingredients quickly, then throughout the presentation we're going to go through them. Uh, first, one, the primary ingredient that I look at is a team, dedicated team for, con for adoption. Uh, the second one is a, an effort that is focused on container adoption, uh, a partner that you can count on, uh, which is an important uh, piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, the adoption, uh, keeping it simple, uh, fail-safe environment, and promote and advertise across the organization, secure and operational, and tangible consumption model, model and finally, uh, measuring and tracking the adoption. Uh, our journey started back in 2016, where uh, we uh, uh, did a bake-off on container platform, and we made, and I took the word out here, a bet, because as a bank, we can't bet. We have to be secure with your money. We made a bet on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, in 2017, we worked with uh, what I call an innovator. And I'm going to expand on innovator in the next slides and so forth uh, to help uh, promote the capability within uh, the organization. And 2018, we were planning to go with two applications to production. Uh, we have three in production. We have major applications uh, launching in June, July. Uh, it's OpenShift is the strategic platform for our digital transformation. Uh, we have 10, uh, I think every week the number keeps increasing. I think I'm up to 15 applications in the pipelines that are making their way to production now. We have hundreds of developers that are trained on OpenShift, and we have a fully operational and secure platform. Uh, what sur surprised us the most is when we launched, the, our expectation it was to have only two applications. It was our practice ground, one small application and one large application to serve our customers in the United States for our online banking platform. And we experienced a hockey stick of demand. And we had more demand that we can supply, and we had to react quickly and step up to be able to, be able to support the demand for it. How did that happen? First, and for, we talked about the dedicated team. Uh, my team is uh, responsible for mentoring and training people, enabling people on continuous delivery. Uh, within the organization. So we have all binary management, we have Ansible for automated deployment, we have database automation, and we have container deployment. Even though within the organization they know us as the OpenShift team, even though that's not officially our, uh, our name. Uh, that team itself uh, is responsible for uh, enabling everybody within the organization, enabling the operations, enabling the information security, enabling the engineers, enabling the developers, and building the DevOps pipeline for continuous delivery, delivery within the application and training uh, developers on the uh, pipeline. The second piece is focus. Uh, when we looked at the spectrum of container adoption, especially when we were doing the initial bake-off, uh, we made a conscious choice that our transformation is about the adoption of container. It's not about the changing of the behavior of the developer. Uh, one of the things with, uh, some, uh, with, with uh, other platforms, you need to change the behavior of the developer. So the, they either want to focus on changing the uh, pipeline of the developer, changing their architecture, and getting them to develop, a, to develop a stateless applications, or you can uh, I get the platform like Kubernetes and OpenShift, which what I call it cloud with training wheels, uh, where developers do not have to refactor their application completely to make them 
uh, stateless. What's interesting during that process, even though the development team wanted something with training wheels, they ended up writing applications that are stateless to take advantage of auto scaling, auto recovery, and so forth that OpenShift offers. Uh, partnering with an app dev uh, innovator. And here, that's, that's an important concept because you need a strong partner. And I'm using here the model that was described back in the 2000 by Jeffrey Moore, uh, which is crossing the chasm. And the innovator is uh, that uh, market group, uh, they are opinion uh, leaders and people look at them when they're selecting a platform. And uh, the app dev the innovator, everybody pretends to be an app dev innovator, first of all. So how do you discover who's the app dev innovator? It's someone that is not asking for a business case. It's someone that's gonna go by gut. It's someone that is looking uh, for, uh, is willing to experiment, is willing to fail. Uh, it's willing to invest their best assets, which are their people, into your project to see if it's going to be successful. Uh, once you find the app dev innovator, you cherish them and you start uh, building your use cases around them. And here, this is a busy slide, and this purpose of the slide, uh, this was a news that came out in the newsletter in a couple of weeks ago from the app dev innovator uh, publishing to the whole organization uh, the value that they're getting from the open ships. So they start speaking on your behalf and start uh, communicating to the rest of the organization the value that they are getting and everybody starts to follow at that point because they're looking at the open, the, the opinion leader and now you're hit uh, the, the mass market of, uh, uh, of the users. Uh, when engineering the, the platform, keep it, keep it simple. The first version doesn't have to be complicated. Create an MVP that is functional, functional functional, reliable, usable, convenient, pleasurable, and meaningful, but it doesn't have to have everything. Uh, implementing an OpenShift platform for a cloud platform, especially for a regulated organization like us, requires a lot of things that have to be done to ensure that it's secure, it's scalable, it has disaster recovery in it, has backup, has monitoring, have to integrate it into your own processes. Uh, do not go to the extent just meet the needs of that innovator. And what the innovator wanted from us is a CI CD pipeline that they can provision environments quickly, deploy their application quickly, and see how it scale, and with not a lot of refactoring. And we did that for them. Uh, then the next step, we, we invested our own money. Uh, I belong in a DevOps organization, and we put $100,000 for the development of an application to run within OpenShift. Uh, so by providing the funding, we are not under pressure from the project teams or uh, uh, strategic business alignment. Uh, for example, business breathing down our neck to say, I want this function tomorrow in production. It allows us space to experiment, to fail, to recover, to learn. Uh, and that actually, that application never made it to production. This application was just a training ground. And that's where we use it to showcase and promote. Once we did this application, we actually, uh, what we did is uh, we uh, did a video and we filmed all the innovators uh, across the organization and we played that video for the rest of the organization uh, to show them what we've done uh, on, uh, on that sample application. Uh, we were not uh, worried about spending the money. If a video cost $5,000 to develop a professionally made video, uh, we went ahead and we did that. Uh, then the next step, what we've done is we did a competition. Uh, I call it here a hackathon. I'm gonna dig in a little bit into it uh, in the next slide. Uh, and we ensured that uh, we uh, uh, had a competition where people participated and did something that is meaningful for the organization. And then we gave everybody incentives such as prizes, uh, uh, laptops, money, uh, travels as a result of, uh, uh, of, that, uh, of, of the competition, and that was spread as news across the organization. So the hackathon-like event, uh, considering that we are a company that manages 47,000 people, that have 47,000 people, we could not make people work 24 hours a day. So that does not meet uh, the labor code, so we're not allowed to put them in the same room and say, go at it and create something that is creative and meaningful. Uh, so we wanted something that works for the organization, works for the employees. 
So the way we structured it is we did two sessions of training. One session of training, which was around how to use the platform. Second session of training is how to create an application that works within the platform. All the attendees of uh, the hackathon were, um, it was mandatory for them to attend the sessions. Uh, then on the day of uh, the hackathon, we gave them uh, some restrictions, more restrictions for them to use. They had to use our existing pipeline. They didn't have a choice to use any pipeline that they want to use. So we use Bitbucket, we use Bamboo, we use Jira. So they had to use our pipeline. Uh, second thing is we didn't tell them to create an application from scratch. We told them pick any application from the one that you're working on that you're comfortable with, refactor it, and make it work within the OpenShift platform. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the participant presented to a group of senior leaders. We had all the CIOs, the skeptics and the people and the believers in the room from the CIO level to come and judge the platform. And that was quite amazing because we did the, the developers did stuff that uh, the executive did not expect. I actually didn't expect. Uh, they de de delivered the application that were able to do auto scaling, uh, blue green, uh, showed logging into our Elk platform, straight into Elk platform. And uh, the, actually it's a young two graduates from university that won the prize. Uh, and one of the CIOs asked them, how do we do it today in terms when we go to production? How do we do the fallback to the previous version? And they looked at him and said, like, we don't. We don't have the capability. And I think at that point, that CIO committed all of his platforms to go in on OpenShift uh, to help and resolve that pain. And that's how this major application committed to this platform. Uh, we rewarded the winners with, uh, we, we wanted to send them to a conference, a conference. They selected to have some nice laptops instead of going to the conference. And then we created professional video and we sent that video across the organization and was played uh, in town halls uh, about the event, which now we have more and more people starting to ask us, they want to be on the platform like everyone else because they've seen the, the, the result. Real work started, so now we had to secure, to make it secure and operational. Uh, so we brought more engineers on to uh, engineer the production platform to make sure that we have good networking, we have good DR capabilities. Uh, and uh, being a regulated organization, we have two, uh, two groups that support uh, our environments, one non-prod and one production uh, group. So I took the production people and told them for the next six months, I took, actually I got one, they gave me one, I didn't take any. Uh, that came and worked uh, with our team and he was embedded with our team to learn how to operate the cluster in a non-production environment. So all of a sudden I had one person from an ops team that is fully capable at operating the platform in production. That was our first confidence boost that, boost that now if we go to a production with an application, we have someone in ops that understands it. They know how to recover an application, they know how to deploy the application, they know how to recover OpenShift, they know how to patch it, they know how to secure it and so forth. Uh, inform information security was the other uh, people we had to work with, and we actually created a brand new security standard for OpenShift. And that's, that's, that took us six months to create a new standard, then create a backlog to apply all the standards against OpenShift. And what's interesting with that standard, anyone wants to bring in container platform capability within the organization was measured against that standard. How are you gonna secure it? How are you gonna recover it? How are you gonna patch it? And so forth. So they had to live by these standards. Uh, the next step after that uh, was how do you order OpenShift? We have an elaborate uh, model, financial model within the bank for our investment plan for, uh, for AppDeb. We had to give people that are used to managing pets how to plan and order cattle. So pets is your server, which has a name, you treat it well, and you know what it is. So now it's a cattle, it's a farm of nodes that you don't know that, that exist. So we created a model, small, medium, large, and if a CIO decides that application needs a medium, uh, a medium would have four VMs in production, one at main side, the other one at the DR side, uh, two VMs in uh, 
uh, in uh, the performance environments and six VMs in non-prod environment. It was a standard costing for medium. Anyone asking medium, that's all what they're gonna get. There is no customization to it. And then, uh, this, and then we label these nodes for them to use them. Uh, the other thing we did is the fast track for development where we made the, the provisioning of the OpenShift cluster uh, frictionless. Uh, so when a development team decides to get in on, uh, on OpenShift, I have a set of uh, nodes within the non-dev environment. I can get them to start working the OpenShift, uh, on the OpenShift platform and developing that application, which was faster for them uh, than going and getting VMs. Uh, creating an environment using VMs would take about uh, six to seven weeks at the least. Uh, with OpenShift, while their costing is happening, they can start developing within two to three days. Uh, that attracted the dev, dev team to start using the platform as well because now all of a sudden they can fast track their projects by three to six, six months at, at times to get going. Uh, and finally is the allocation model, uh, getting the, the, the culture transition from uh, pets to cattle. Now you don't own a pet, you own a farm of cattle and you can use that farm of cattle uh, for your own use to scale your application. The next evolution of that might be a flat nodes where they can scale uh, all their application, but we're not there in terms of the culture yet. Uh, last but not least is measuring and track. So we have a dashboard that we've built with Spotfire where it gives us at any one time the number of pods that are running that is visible from a business sense that executives can take a look at it at all time. And this is published actually to the executives uh, across the organization. Uh, they can see how many projects we have, how many builds we're doing. Actually, th there is an anomaly here because uh, there is a team is building so much that they had to clean. Uh, th they would have had more than 14,000 bills in the last, uh, in the last year, but we, they, we, we get them to keep purging their, uh, their bills. Uh, that big line uh, on the, the top right chart is quite interesting because that big, big line is uh, one of the project teams had 13 environments when, uh, in the VM world. Once they started using the OpenShift platform, they went to about 68 projects, the equivalent of 68 uh, environments. And what's interesting is they're using three VMs to run what they used to run on 50 VMs. So we experienced a huge density in there in terms of uh, utilization. Uh, so we still have a minute and 38 seconds. If there are any questions, happy to take them. So you have a great model for, for getting buy-in across multiple levels of the organization. You obviously had some great um, support. I'm curious about how you were able to achieve that level of support um, from the other teams and leaders that you obviously had it from and what steps were necessary to maintain such a high level of support as you went through the various phases. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna use a buzzword probably, is the power of the community. Uh, we, uh, we did have executive support to be able to invest into the promotion and the advertisement. Uh, but to be honest with you, I had to take my foot off the gas because the adoption rate based on the word within the community that was flowing around between the various leaders was catching fire faster than my ability to support them. I had to slow down a little bit from the advertisement, so I had the other problem. I have more demand than I had supply, and actually I had to staff up. I had to add three more people to my team to be able to support the supply before go getting back into advertising. So it was the community that did it for us based on following the, the, the model of having the innovator to speak to us instead of us speaking for, for the product, for the service. Thank you very much, Jamil. Perfect. Thank you. Oh.